This episode of The Cyberwire is made possible in part by Barracuda. Cyber criminals are working overtime. Last year, in the fourth quarter alone, phishing attacks disguised as COVID testing information increased by 521%. Barracuda has identified 13 types of email threats and how cyber criminals use them to steal money from your company or personal information from your employees and customers. Find out about the 13 email threat types and how Barracuda can provide complete email protection for your teams, your customers, and your reputation. Get your free ebook at barracuda.com slash cyberwire. That's barracuda.com slash cyberwire. Zelensky addresses the House of Commons cyber operations in Russia's war against Ukraine. Chinese cyber espionage campaigns hit six U.S. state governments, a surge in mobile malware. Joe Kerrigan looks at de-restricting your software. Our guest Bob Dudley discusses cyber attacks against the European energy sector. And a quick look back at Patch Tuesday. From the CyberWire studios at Data Tribe, I'm Dave Bittner with your CyberWire summary for Wednesday, March 9th, 2022. Ukrainian President Zelensky addressed the British House of Commons by video link yesterday. He thanked the UK for its support and struck a deliberately Churchillian note, quote, We will not give up and we will not lose. We will fight to the end in the sea, in the air. We will fight for our land, whatever the costs. We will fight in the forests, in the fields, on the shores, in the streets. End quote. He asked for more support, quote, Please increase the pressure of sanctions against this country and please recognize this country as a terrorist state. And please make sure that our Ukrainian skies are safe. Please make sure that you do what needs to be done and what is stipulated by the greatness of your country. End quote. The Telegraph reports that the MPs gave him a standing ovation. Western nations, which include a number of geographically eastern nations, have increased their sanctions against Russia, moving to block or at least significantly limit Russian oil and gas exports. Augmenting these formal sanctions has been a widespread exit of private companies from Russian markets. That exit extends across many, perhaps most, sectors. The effect on the Russian economy is already significant. Market Insider reports that Fitch has cut its rating of Russian debt from B to C and warned that default on Russian sovereign debt is imminent. The cyber phases of Russia's hybrid war continue to be far more limited and restrained than most had expected. An analysis in the Washington Post argues that this was to be expected, that offensive cyber operations have never been a war winner, and that therefore Russia's minji DDoS and defacement attacks were about what we should have expected. There's something to the analyst's skepticism concerning cyber not being decisive— But then, it's not usually the case that a particular capability in a particular domain is decisive. No one would seriously question the combat value of air power, but it would be difficult to make the case that air power alone has ever been decisive, and simple lack of decisive effect wouldn't seem to rule out the use of any capability. The analysts point out that earlier Russian disruptions of the Ukrainian power grid were temporary and relatively quickly remediated. But disruption of a grid, even if it lasts only a matter of hours, could be of considerable value in supporting a tactical operation. So the mystery remains. Why hasn't Russia so far executed the disruptive attacks it's shown itself capable of, or the destructive capabilities that in all probability it has? For all that, U.S. and European policymakers continue to watch for a significant increase in the Russian cyber threat waiting, as the record puts it, for the other shoe to drop. In the EU, Reuters reports, the telecommunications ministers of the 27 members have called upon Europe to establish an emergency fund that would be used to respond to major cyber attacks. Citing the war in Ukraine, the ministers who will meet today to discuss the proposal said, 
The current geopolitical landscape and its impacts in cyberspace strengthen the need for the EU to fully prepare to face large-scale cyber attacks. Such a fund will directly contribute to this objective. End quote. The U.S. intelligence community's recently released annual threat report, for example, published as Russia was completing its preparations to invade Ukraine, highlights the threat in cyberspace and suggests that Russia would wish to avoid direct kinetic combat with the U.S. The report said, quote, We assess that Russia does not want a direct conflict with U.S. forces. Russia seeks an accommodation with the United States on mutual non-interference in both countries' domestic affairs and U.S. recognition of Russia's claimed sphere of influence over much of the former Soviet Union, end quote. In cyber proper, even excluding the related problem of what the ODNI calls malign influence, the report says, quote, Russia is particularly focused on improving its ability to target critical infrastructure, including underwater cables and industrial control systems, in the United States as well as in allied and partner countries, because compromising such infrastructure improves and demonstrates its ability to damage infrastructure during a crisis. Russia is also using cyber operations to attack entities it sees as working to undermine its interests or threaten the stability of the Russian government. Russia attempts to hack journalists and organizations worldwide that investigate Russian government activity and in several instances has leaked their information. End quote. Researchers at Mandiant report that the Chinese government threat actor APT-41, also known as Barium, Winty, or Wicked Panda, has succeeded in gaining access to the governments of at least six U.S. states. Some of the attacks exploited Log4j vulnerabilities. The campaign's goals are unclear, but there seems to have been some attempt to collect personal identifiable information. This might serve espionage, but APT-41 has also been known to engage in financially motivated APT side hustles. Security firm Proofpoint describes a surge in mobile malware afflicting Europe in particular, up by 500% since last month. They say, quote, Most mobile malware is still downloaded from app stores, but over the past year or so, we've seen an increase in campaigns that use SMS and mobile messaging as their delivery mechanism. Of the two big mobile smartphone platforms, the latter is a far more popular target for cyber criminals. End quote. The common strains of malware being observed include Flubot, T-Bot, Tanglebot, Makau, Brata, Tiana Spy, and Keep Spy. The Zero Day Initiative summarizes yesterday's Patch Tuesday. Microsoft issued 71 patches in addition to the 21 issues Microsoft Edge fixed earlier this month, which brings the total number of March fixes to 92. Three of the vulnerabilities are rated critical, which the Zero Day Initiative thinks for the second month running is curiously low. 68 others are rated important. Adobe issued three patches that affected Adobe Photoshop, Illustrator, and After Effects. None of these vulnerabilities is known to be under active attack in the wild either. And finally, CISA issued three ICS security advisories yesterday. So, get out there and get patching, friends. And now, a word from our sponsor, Recorded Future. Staying one step ahead of the rapidly evolving threat landscape requires a constant flow of daily intelligence. To stay up to date on everything happening in the world of cybersecurity, join over 50,000 other security professionals who subscribe to the Cyber Daily. With daily email updates on the latest cybersecurity news, top threat actors, exploited vulnerabilities, suspicious IP addresses, and more, the Cyber Daily is the first thing security professionals check every morning. To learn more and subscribe for free, go to recordedfuture.com slash cyber dash daily. And we thank Recorded Future for sponsoring our show. Bob Dudley is former CEO of BP and is currently chairman of the board of directors at risk management software provider Axio. I checked in with him for insights on the European response to cyber threats to critical infrastructure, especially given the ongoing situation in Ukraine. 
Well, like we saw in North America with the colonial pipeline and we've seen the indications are that uh, ransomware attacks are do appear to be opportunistic. They are, of course, to make money. They appear to be emanating from Eastern Europe or Russia or, or in those areas. No one's quite sure. Um, oftentimes, in an attempt to raise money, it's a little bit like they're not quite sure of the tiger they've grabbed by the tail. So they may not have a full understanding of the implications it has for movement of fuel. And it isn't apparent to people that this is really to disrupt fuel movements. It's to make money. But sometimes the economic impacts are so great that uh, they actually don't want that sort of attention. So it's hard to say right now. And of course, I think uh, everyone is a bit on edge uh, due to the situation in Ukraine. How has that affected the industry? Is, is uh, I suspect there's enhanced vigilance at this, at this moment? Well, yes. Yeah, cyber is something you should always have vigilance on all the time. Governments have issued warnings to not only energy, but all industry and all companies that they should expect a heightened level of cyber activity and they should be absolutely vigilant and ready to respond. So at the moment, you know, companies have their defenses, they have their ways of doing this, and I think they've got their finger on the triggers and the buttons to be able to respond. And, you know, for your for your listeners, sometimes I call it, you know, you be ready to unplug things. And it's not exactly what happens, but be able to separate your systems very, very quickly so things don't spread through. And I know there's a heightened level of awareness. And to be honest, companies have different levels of preparedness here. Big companies tend to have large, you know, teams that can be ready, smaller companies. And like some of the stuff that's happened recently in terms of distribution of fuel, these are not really large companies. Hopefully, there will be a dissemination of lessons learned from this around industry and energy. What about on the diplomacy side of things? I mean, are we seeing, you know, pushes from governments that these sorts of things, critical infrastructure should be off limits for this sort of uh, privateering on, on behalf of the bad guys? Well, I think, I think it's hard to put your finger on who the bad guys are. I mean, you mm -hmm. know, there are those that believe it's opportunistic people trying to raise money and uh, take money for ransom. And there are some that believe it's connected to state actors. Um, and I think maybe there's a combination of both. Um, I think the big question in, in terms of diplomacy is also from governments signaling, you know, they can respond as well. <laughs> And uh, mm. and so do you want to set off a tit-for-tat set of responses? And, and what do you want to let uh, other governments know? I don't know of a single state actor in this country that has yet admitted that any of these things are related to the state. And so that makes d diplomacy quite tricky if they would be involved. Yeah, I mean, it's an interesting uh, situation, isn't it, where you ha have these – you know, these private companies, but obviously the uh, protection of um, critical infrastructure is, is of a, a national interest. Is it fair to say that makes some of the lines a little fuzzy? Yes, of course it does. And the legal lines here are also, and regulatory lines are also a bit fuzzy. You know, I'll, t I'll take the mm -hmm. United States, which has, you know, probably the most, be kind here, the most developed litigious system in the world. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> so companies can be held liable even if they're doing everything correctly. Um, it's less so in Europe, which is why I think there's more information sharing. But there is a lot of – it's not only infrastructure, critical infrastructure. It's also about customer data and energy companies are involved in that. And there's huge fines in uh, both Europe and the U.S. if customer data is somehow compromised. So – it creates – and governments rarely tell a company what to do. They want to know what's going on, but they can't give them advice. Um, you know, do you pay ransomware? If you pay ransomware to sanctioned organizations or individuals somewhere, then a company can be subject to <laughs> somehow cooperating on this and have fines. So we have a ways to uh, evolve both yet to evolve in Europe and in North America between government and companies on exactly how to respond and what to do. 
That's Bob Dudley. He's former CEO of BP and currently chairman of the board of directors at risk management software provider Axio. And now, a word from our sponsor, SpyCloud. SpyCloud constantly recovers and analyzes new data from the criminal underground, a realm packed with credentials, personal information, passwords, and customer information exposed in third-party data breaches, combo lists, and malware infections. With SpyCloud, you now have access to this data that historically has not been available and can take preventative efforts to defend your business against costly cyber attacks and hard-to-detect fraud that can negatively impact your bottom line and brand reputation. Visit spycloud.com slash cyberwire to learn how to make recaptured data your best defense. That's spycloud.com slash cyberwire. And we thank SpyCloud for sponsoring our show. And joining me once again is Joe Kerrigan. He's from the Johns Hopkins University Information Security Institute. Also my co-host over on the Hacking Humans podcast. Hello, Joe. Hi, Dave. Uh, Article caught my eye. This is uh, from Paul Ducklin over at uh, the Naked Security blog from Sophos. Good old duck, yep. Um, And uh, it's titled Ransomware with a Difference, De-Restrict Your Software or Else. Right. (laughs) What's going on here, Joe? Well, uh, it's all about cryptocurrencies, Dave. Yep. Some cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin and Ethereum and others that are based on similar uh, technologies have a model called proof of work in order to determine who gets to create the next block. Okay. And that process is called mining. And that process is essentially a hashing algorithm where you have to get a hash below a certain value. Okay. That is, for all intents and purposes, effectively a random process. All right. Meaning that you have to demonstrate that you've done enough work to find this to merit putting a block on the chain. Okay. Now, it's done all throughout the network. So the first person to find the next block wins, and they actually get a cryptocurrency reward given to them. Okay. So that's a financial incentive. So people go out and they buy these graphics cards because your CPU can do the work, but a graphics card can do it a lot faster. And this whole process is extraordinarily computationally intensive. Very computationally intensive. Right. Exactly. Okay. And it's computationally simple as well. Mm -hmm. So it's a lot of work that can be done by small processors like the thousands of processors, stream processors that are in a GPU. Right. So massive parallel processing versus the more serial processing that goes through a regular CPU. The GPU are massively parallel. Correct. Right, okay. So that means people can actually go out and buy a $1,500 graphics card and make a profit off of it. What does that do to the graphics card market? Oh, I can tell you. I have a friend (laughs) uh, who does 3D rendering. He does, um, you know, like animation for NASA. And they have, for a couple years now, had a real hard time buying graphics cards that they need to do their work because they're all getting scooped up by the crypto miners. It's remarkably difficult. Yeah, and the prices have gone through the roof. Right. I bought a GTX 1080 four years ago, five years ago. Yeah. It was 700 bucks. Okay. The current price for a comparable line model is like like 1,600 bucks. Wow. And that's retail. Yeah. So I still run my GTX 1080. (laughs) <laughs> okay. Right? The crypto mining has jacked this up. So NVIDIA's response to this was May of last year, they started putting hardware into their, into these cards that allowed them to limit the hash rate. When the card sees that it's doing hash rate limit, uh, hashing of Ethereum blockchain, it limits the hash rate. Okay. And that is a change that can be activated by a driver. So NVIDIA was saying... In order to uh, do a better job of, with supply and demand, we're going to make these cards less attractive to crypto miners. Exactly. So that the folks who need them as GPUs, gamers or animators or whoever, right. uh, they will be able to get their hands on them. Absolutely. Okay. That's exactly right. All right. Now, they're also marketing a new crypto mining line as well based on similar processors, but it just, this doesn't do any video output. It just does crypto mining. I see. Now, those cards are five grand. Yeah. Right? Premium cards. Right. Okay. Uh, So, somebody 
was irritated by NVIDIA doing this. Uh, and they, they have broken into NVIDIA's systems and, they've, and they, they claim to have downloaded a terabyte of data. And now they're threatening NVIDIA with <laughs> releasing this data if NVIDIA doesn't disable the what they call LHR, which is uh, limited hash rate, I think. Hmm. So now NVIDIA has a, I guess, a dilemma. I mean, do they? <laughs> I mean, it's, it's a new wrinkle on ransomware, right? It is. Rather than asking for money, they're asking for a feature to be enabled. Right. They're, they're, or asking for the, the feature to be disabled, the hash yeah. rate limiting feature to be disabled. Right. Now, here's the interesting dynamic here, right? Normally, I say you should never let the threat of a data release be part of your calculus for whether or not you pay the ransom or comply with the demands, right? Okay. But here's the thing. NVIDIA actually could say, okay, we'll comply with your demands mm -hmm. if you never release our, our data. But if we ever see that data released, we're going to go ahead and just reissue the, the patch. Mm. I don't know if that will have any impact yeah, That's you, could have a bunch of, you could have a bunch of unpatched systems that are right, not yeah. connected to the internet that wouldn't get an automatic firmware update. Right. So they would be fine. They would but be, yeah, they would never on the other hand, you know, G, like anything in electronics, GPOs, they age. Right. And today's hot GPU is not yesterday's hot GPU and right. is not tomorrow's hot GPU. Correct. So there's that as well. So, yeah. So NVIDIA does have leverage here if they decide they're going to comply. I don't think they're going to comply. Yeah. And, and I'm not sure I would comply for this. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, one of the big problems right now is it's, we're having a hard time getting chips. You know, NVIDIA is no different. They just cannot meet the demand mm -hmm. that's caused by these, these cryptocurrency miners out there. The cryptocurrency miners are, whenever they see a card, they'll buy it up because they do the calculation and they find out that, they're, they're, that there's a return on investment. Yeah. So they just buy them up. Uh, scalpers go out and they buy, they buy the cards uh, and then wait for the supply to run out and then charge double to gamers or to miners for mm -hmm. the cards. Mm -hmm. The people who get the, uh, you know, who who take it here the worst are the people who just want to buy a, a graphics card for playing games. Right, um, right. You know, and I have done cryptocurrency mining. Uh, I don't do it anymore. I just, it's just not profitable. So no sense in me doing it. Yeah. It's interesting that they're not blocking Bitcoin mining though, but I don't think Bitcoin mining is at all profitable because there are actually hardware miners that do a really good job of mining Bitcoin. Yeah. Well, there's also the environmental consideration. There too. is. Yeah, the, that's a different concern. The, the amount these, of power these that's required to right. do all of this is extraordinary. If there were only five people in the world, or even if there were only a million people in the world or a million processors in the world who were, uh, who were doing the proof of work effort, then this would not be an issue. But now there are billions of processors doing it. Yeah. There are mining pools out there that collaborate on these proof of work things. There's another way you can determine who generates the next block, and that's with a, an algorithm called proof of stake, where that doesn't require nearly the amount of power. Uh, it, I mean, it's orders of magnitude better for the, for the consumption of power. Hmm. There are cryptocurrencies out there that are proof of stake as opposed to proof of work. Of course, there's always the talk amongst the users of these cryptocurrencies or, and the development community, whether or not they should move from a proof of work to a proof of stake. Uh, I think that's something that should definitely be considered by all of these these currencies. Yeah, yeah. All right, well, it's an interesting story for sure. As I say, a yeah, wrinkle on ransomware. Going to be really interesting to see how this unfolds. Yeah. I'll yeah. make a prediction. I don't think uh, NVIDIA caves. Yeah. All right, again, that's over on the Naked Security blog uh, by Sophos. Uh, Paul Ducklin wrote that one. Uh, Joe Kerrigan, thanks for joining us. It's my pleasure, Dave. Thanks to all of our sponsors for making this CyberWire possible, especially our supporting sponsor, Arctic Wolf. End cyber risk for your organization with the Arctic Wolf Security Operations Cloud and Concierge Security Model. Learn more at arcticwolf.com slash cyberwire. And that's the CyberWire. For links to all of today's stories, check out our daily briefing at thecyberwire.com. The CyberWire podcast is proudly produced in Maryland out of the startup studios of Data Tribe, where they're co-building the next generation of cybersecurity teams and technologies. Our amazing CyberWire team is Elliot Peltzman, Trey Hester, Brandon Karp, 
Eliana White, Peru Prakash, Justin Sabi, Tim Nodar, Joe Kerrigan, Carol Terrio, Ben Yellen, Nick Vilecki, Gina Johnson, Bennett Moe, Chris Russell, John Petrick, Jennifer Ivan, Rick Howard, Peter Kilpie, and I'm Dave Bittner. Thanks for listening. We'll see you back here tomorrow. And now, a word from our sponsor, Code42. Did you know that there's a one in three chance that your company will lose IP when an employee quits? Cybersecurity teams are facing unprecedented challenges when it comes to protecting sensitive corporate data from exposure, leak, and theft. The annual Data Exposure Report 2022 from Code42 revealed three key trends that are accelerating insider risk. First, the continued adoption of cloud technologies and a lack of visibility into them. Second, the impact of the great resignation and departing employees' theft of IP and sensitive data. And third, the challenges of the new hybrid remote workforce and uncertainty over how to address it. As insider risk grows, Code42's insider risk management approach helps protect data without slowing down business. Learn more at code42.com slash showme. And we thank Code42 for sponsoring our show.